we look at the broader market sentiment, that's clearly become a little bit more bearish over the last two weeks or so. Even though the Fed has raised rates an extraordinary amount, there are parts of the economy that still remain very, very insulated from it. They're coming to the end of hikes. That's without a doubt. I think 6% is a hard, hard cap. I think the extent to which we get global disinflation might catch markets by surprise. I think it's a bit premature to say, OK, the coast is clear now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning from our New York City studios. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Matt Miller alongside Damian Sassauer. Tom, John, and Lisa are in Jackson Hole ahead of their special coverage. That kicks off at 8 a.m. Eastern, and they'll be on air for four hours throughout Powell's speech uh, and beyond. So definitely um, a, a show that you don't want to miss. It's, I think, more important now, Damian, uh, because you know yesterday and going into NVIDIA earnings on Wednesday, the narrative was, wow, NVIDIA earnings may be more important than Jackson Hole. But after the market action we saw yesterday, I don't think that's true anymore. NVIDIA news, it felt like last year already. I mean, my goodness. But I mean, I think it's as we set up for Jackson Hole, but the fallout effects from higher debt servicing costs, both at, both at the fiscal level, I mean, we chips, acts, IRA, but at the household level, student loans. Did you know the word student loan was mentioned in S&P com companies who are announcing their earnings 40 times, by far the most ever. So the fact that student loans are resuming, Households are going to have to resume payments on their student loans. It's really going to impact consumption and yeah, spending. Yeah, student I think loan that's a big and shrink. Fear. Yeah, yeah, a, a, a real concern for sure. And I just thought it was interesting. You know, Nvidia had such a blowout quarter, and the shares rallied. They were up seven percent in the early session yesterday, and they closed up only one tenth of one percent. We had all the major indexes closing down below one percent. Tech really leading the losses. So everyone is looking forward to Jackson Hole to see what the Fed has to say about rate raises. Do they have one more hike left? Sure. And as, if you look at equity market action into Asia over night also in my twan i mean the big chinese food delivery service i mean they had i mean uh, revenues were up i think a third i mean double like what they were and now i mean my goodness the shares were down down seven percent overnight because basically you just can't get anyone to buy anything with china's name on it unfortunately yeah and on the debt servicing costs i saw a story by liz mccormick the estimates now considering the size of deficits 1.6 trillion yeah. this year um are that debt servicing alone uh, in the years ahead is going to be 20% of all federal revenues right. if we don't change something. So that's yeah, going to be... fundamentals don't matter anymore. Come on. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that, that could be the case, and I guess it happened in other countries. Let's take a look at what's going on in uh, markets right now. We did have, as I said, big drops in the benchmark indexes yesterday. The S&P 500 futures this morning are up, but only about one-tenth of one percent uh, as we fell down below 4,400 on Thursday's trade. You can see uh, the euro dollar is down right now. Um, the greenback stronger against the euro and the pound. So the Bloomberg dollar index moving up just a little bit. And we do have a 107 handle uh, there. We heard some strategists yesterday saying, considering the interest rate differentials, we should be more like 105, 106. Take a look at the U.S. 10-year yield. It had come down pretty substantially after rising up to uh, more than a decade uh, high. It was uh, actually the highest level it had been since 2007. So far before, um, you know, the collapse of Lehman Brothers was the last time we saw anything over 430. At the beginning of this week, we saw 434, I believe, at the high. We then came down below 420, and we're now back up at four and a quarter. The uh, crude price back up over $80 a barrel, but it also lost a lot of steam this week. And um, now we're starting to gain some of that back. We saw a drawdown yesterday, and there are reportedly talks between the Biden administration and Venezuela into easing some sanctions so they can bring some more of that in. We're going to cover all this for you in the program ahead. Right now, crude trading at $80.16 a barrel. I want to bring in Steve Sosnick right now, Chief Strategist at Interactive Brokers, up early in New Canaan for us. Steve, great to have you on the program. What do you expect today from Jackson Hole? What's the big uh, issue that you're going to be watching for? Good morning, Matt. Thanks for having me. Um, I think this morning what I'm going to be watching for is, do we get a replay of last year's type of speech, which is um, him sort of sternly talking into a camera, you know, with the nice prairie and mountain backdrop. Um, but what we've gotten before from Powell is sort of a, 
on one hand, it's this, but it still could be that, you know, like we, we'll, we'll raise rates, but we can cut him. But because I think he does that when he's in the room with with reporters, and I think he's basically a nice enough guy and doesn't want to be super confrontational. When he's standing by himself reading from a script, he sticks to his message. And I think his message will be, number one, we continue to fight inflation. Number two, we may, we may be done hiking rates, but we're not cutting them. I, the analogy I'm using here is, with, with all due sensitivity to people who've been affected by fires, <laughs> The the fight the fight against inflation is eighty percent contained. Um, we've we've gotten we've basically done about eighty percent of the work we need to to back, get inflation back toward the Fed target, but we're not there yet. And just as firefighters don't put away their equipment when the fire is eighty percent contained, he's going to remind people that the Fed is not going away until the job is done. And I don't know that the market really wants to hear that. Only you, Jay Powell, can prevent uh, resurgence in inflation, <laughs> especially with the resurgence that we've seen in GDP growth. Right? I mean, depending where you look. Um, at which now cast um, you, you, you consider uh, 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 more important. We're looking at four, five, six percent nominal growth. Um, are you concerned about a resurgence in inflation? Are those embers going to spark the fire back to life again? Um, I, I think so. Um, although there are some different, you know, you met, you guys mentioned the student loans at the top of the hour. I think that's going to be a bit of a headwind. I do think also, uh, you know, the fact that call it a third of Americans are facing utility bills that they've, of the likes they've never seen before. Both of those are headwinds on spending. And remember, the consumer is two thirds of the economy still. Um, but you know, the bottom line is people have jobs. Unemployment is low. People have money. They spend it when they do. Um, you know, they, I think they're moving a bit more toward necessities away from discretionary spending in many cases. But if if people have jobs, which is great, and they're earning and they're earning uh, more money, which is also great if you're the person getting the money, not so much if you're the Fed or, or the employer, um, then that money is going to be spent and that's going to have positive effects on the economy. I'm not too concerned about that, but this is why the Fed has to remain vigilant and continue to give that message of vigilance. Steve, I know it's early, but I wonder if you can put on your options hat for me. I mean, cross asset falls, I'm talking FX rates, equity have been very, very well behaved of late, but a lot of these risks that you mentioned are are still out there. What's really going on there? That, first of all, it's never too early, Damien, to put my options hat on. It's on all the time. Um, but the, you know, it, it, it's actually been kind of fascinating because you would think that a, a, a restrictive monetary environment would be um, would induce inflation. I'm sorry, would induce volatility. But but we really haven't seen that. Part of that is there's been a fair amount of dispersion between between assets, certainly on the equity side. Um, and when you get dispersion um, among, let's say, an index or a basket, that actually does depress volatility. If stock A goes up and stock B goes down, well, the index has gone nowhere. Um, and so that's depressed it on the equity side. Um, and and also the idea that people have de-risked. You, you know, a lot of the a lot of the institutions that drive VIX and things like that have moved to cash. In terms of you know the bond market, the bond market we, we are starting to see the volatility pick up again. Um, and in terms of cross markets and, and FX, um, again, it, it it we we've sort of got these relatively well behaved. Um, regimes, I, you know, for whatever reason, as you say, that, you know, I do think the euro um, probably is a little overvalued here on a technical basis. Uh, but as long as investors are just sort of willing to sit on their hands, um, and I don't really know where the complacency comes from, but as long as people remain relatively complacent, uh, you know, realized and implied volatilities tend to remain uh, subdued. You know, I find it so interesting. You first mentioned cash and then you mentioned complacency, right? And so for me, you know, with vols at these current levels, I mean, is this the time you believe investors, I mean, look, we're going into the seasonally weak September, October period, right? I hate to talk seasonals, but, you know, for whatever it's worth, is this the time to be buying protection? Uh, yes, I, I, I think you know buy buy the dip is buy the dip is an important mantra no matter what you're trading, and I think it's especially important right now in volatility. You know, you talk about seasonals. Um, the best month, the best seasonal month for VIX is August, and the reason being is VIX. Uh, you know, I don't know that people always appreciate it, but VIX is designed to be the best market's best estimate of volatility over the coming 30 days. Well, what comes 30 days after August? That's September. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the idea that 
um, you know, we haven't seen much of a rally in volatility. We haven't seen people looking for volatility protection comes from the idea that I think a lot of the institutions who are the big traders of VIX feel that they've de-risked sufficiently so that they don't need the vol protection. But that's one of those things in my career as an option trader. Um, you know, it's like selling umbrellas <laughs> during a drought. You know, nobody wants them when, when it hasn't rained in a while. But as soon as those clouds appear, guess what? Um, you, you can't get enough of them. And so that's why I like to be very opportunistic. Um, and I think, a, you know, a, a 16, 17, 16 VIX, which was yesterday and before we were, before we moved up, you know, provided an opportunity. We're still below long term averages um, in terms of in terms of major volatility measures on the equity side. You're not wrong about the seasonality. I just pulled up the SEAG function on the Bloomberg terminal, which is a tremendous. Um, uh, gives you a tremendous picture of seasonality. Uh, put on the heat map, and I see over the last 29 years, we've added nine points on average in August, uh, more than any other month of the year. So I think that's absolutely fascinating. What happened, speaking of volatility, yesterday with NVIDIA? I mean, this was, you know, the earnings report that uh, it's the most important earnings report I can remember in recent history. And expectations were so high, and they knocked the ball out of the park nonetheless. We had uh, a 7% gain between 9.30 and 10, and then it just started to dissipate. By the end of the day, we were basically unched on um, NVIDIA. Why is that? Yeah, I, I agree with you that I was also thinking this is a most, among the most consequential um, earnings reports I can remember. Um, but this is what happens when, when, you know, when you outkick the coverage to a certain extent. Um, you know, my fear going into the number was that they, would, they wouldn't really change their guidance. They would say, our guidance last quarter was fabulous and we're going to stick with it. And that would have, I don't know, I shudder to think what would have happened considering how built up the stock got. Another important thing to remember is traders react, investors consider. And so the traders looked at that number. I looked at that number when it came out and said, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe they I can't believe they came out with this." But as you thought about it and thought where the where the valuations were and how much the valuations have expanded, um, not just in the aftermath of last quarter's report, but in the in the weeks or two coming into this report, the, the, there wasn't there wasn't really much left. And I think the the investors. Um, who you know who thought about it a bit more coolly than the than the traders who reacted, you know said you know what this is still a this is a pretty fully valued company even with this new guidance um, we're not going to chase into it and so you didn't get the institutional follow through uh, that I think you got you know from from the from the first round of buying and without follow through and with perhaps a little profit taking. Um, you know, you end up you end up with a messy, messy kind of blah day that you had that you ended up with yesterday. All right. Maybe uh, traders wanted to get a little bit neutral into uh, the Jackson Hole speech. Steve Sosnick from Interactive Brokers. Great to get your insight this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. We are. Uh, awaiting, obviously, Jackson Hole. And one of the conversations, Damien, we were having yesterday is whether the Fed would even consider moving the goalposts no. on inflation, right? I don't think so either. But I look down and see uh, on the eco screen that we're getting UMish inflation expectations out today. And one year out, it looks like the survey, at least, is for 3.3%. Yeah, well, I mean, look, it's, it's, look, growth is slowing, credit is tightening, and it's not unusual to see unemployment at these really low levels before things roll over, you know? So I take what Scott Sosnick is saying to heart, you know? I mean, vol markets are really not reacting to some of the risks that I think are out there. What I wanted to ask was really, what do we believe the pain trade is for markets? Is it really long U.S. Treasury yields rising to the extent that we've seen in recent weeks? Can that, can that extend? That's the real question for me. All right, well, we have plenty of people to talk to about that coming up, including Dana DeOria of InvestNet. She joins us at 7 a.m., an interview you don't want to miss, and we'll continue to build up to our co coverage. The special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom, John, and Lisa out of Jackson Hole. That starts at 8 a.m. Uh, on this Friday. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. We have to be uh, cautious uh, this time around because uh, downside uh, risks that we identified in June in our forecast have materialized 
This is an inversion uh, of what uh, happened throughout the pandemic uh, recovery, because usually we have been um, surprised in the upside. There's Mario Zentino there, the uh, governor of the Bank of Portugal, speaking yesterday to Bloomberg from the annual Jackson Hole Symposium. Of course, we're going to go out to Jackson Hole shortly, and Tom, John, and Lisa have special coverage for you all morning long. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the key factors that's played into inflation uh, over the past couple of years that the Fed has tried to uh, try, been trying to deal with, as well as the uh, Biden administration, is oil. Um, we saw a, a big run up in prices at the pump that then came back down. Now we're back up um, to levels that we haven't seen in, in quite some time, as uh, we saw a resurgence in the underlying barrels of crude as well. And Rita Sen, co founder and director of research at Energy Aspects, joins us uh, this morning out of Italy for a look at what is going on in terms of oil, and Rita. Um, you know, the, the march up made sense to me as we have the Saudis and Russia tightening supply. Um, on the other hand, we see some weakness, which also makes sense because the resurgence of the Chinese economy has been far weaker than uh, expected post-COVID. So what's your general view of the oil price now at, I mean, $85 a barrel for, uh, for Brent, essentially um, $80 a barrel for NYMEX crude? I mean, look, the, it, you're exactly right in saying that there are quite a few pull and push forces. It's not a very clear that this is, you know, this is like a very bullish market or a very bearish market. I think what I will highlight, though, is that fundamentally, uh, the Saudi cuts and the OPEC plus cuts have been instrumental in getting uh, crude inventories joined. We are looking at potentially record draws uh, in August uh, for inventories overall uh, of around 4 million barrels per day. We've rarely seen a monthly draw of that sort. But, and, and you know, I think that's partly why there's a lot of uh, skepticism in the market. Everybody keeps asking me, oh, but these cuts can be reversed. And I mean, I will maintain that I think Prince Abdulaziz in particular is very keen to make sure that we don't have inventories rebuilding. So it's not that they're just going to reverse the cuts overnight. And he has highlighted that. But even if you take that away, I think the thing that the market is missing is just how tight oil products markets are. And you mentioned uh, gas prices at the pump as well. That has been going up, uh, as has been diesel, because fundamentally demand has actually surprised to the upside significantly this year. Even China, right? The macro is weak, but oil demand is growing by 2 million barrels per day. And refining capacity has really struggled. Amrit, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the marginal producers, producers, both in oil and gas. You know, when I think of oil, you know, I don't really think of Iran the way I used to, but... Lo and behold, Iran has really re-entered the market and certainly impacting prices, at least at the margin. And then in gas, Algeria and the importance of that nation to the European uh, energy supply. I wonder if you could just comment briefly on both those two countries within, you know, this world we now live in, this multipolar world where, you know, countries are being asked to pick a side between China and the U.S. Yeah, I mean, look, the Iran thing on oil is interesting for the simple reason that everybody's been talking about, oh, what could Iran bring back should sanctions be lifted? The U.S. administration has taken an active strategy to not uh, really enforce the sanctions. So Iran has been able to surprise us and the market this year. They are exporting quite a lot. I mean, we think uh, production in Iran is almost 3 million barrels per day uh, and rising uh, further in, into year end. And I think that's, that's where, in some ways, even if sanctions were to get lifted, it's not going to really make a difference because Iran is producing what it can right now. And yes, you're exactly right. I think that has been the one miss this year for oil uh, market watchers where supply has outperformed expectations um, and that has definitely had an impact on prices at the margin. Similarly for gas, I mean, right now, the big news, of course, has been the Australian strikes or the potential threat of Australian strikes. Uh, and that had buoyed gas prices across the board, TTF and uh, JKM. And uh, we've been saying for a while that, look, we don't think, especially if the strikes don't materialize, we are going to get uh, European gas prices come off. And again, Algeria is, is supply-wise, I think Europe is being given plenty of supply, be it from Algeria, be it from the Middle East, or even from the U.S., stocks are actually brimming. It's a complete contrast of what had happened last year this time. So, so Amrita, despite the Woodside strike being averted, you know, it's my understanding that Chevron's two downstream Australian facilities, I believe Gorgon and Wheatstone, and we're not quite out of the woods yet, are we? Correct. And we're not out of the woods yet. Um, but I guess the market is a little bit more hopeful 
given that at least one of the strikes have been averted. Uh, but no, we are watching that very, very closely, what happens with Chevron, because um, obviously that is going to have a material impact in terms of gas flows out of Australia, but also condensate. They, they, it will actually, at the margin, have an impact on oil as well. How important is um, the recession, the on again and off again recession we see in Germany and Europe uh, maybe getting worse? Because unlike Americans, if the economy is bad in Europe, they can leave their Volkswagen Golfs at home and get on a train. Yeah, very true. But I think that they have pretty much most Europeans have probably already left their Volkswagen at home and they do take the train. And what is fascinating for me this year is, you know, we've been talking about a recession and whenever I'm uh, talking to you guys as well, it's been like a 12 month thing now. Right. We've we keep talking about this recession and yet oil demand has been around like at the start of the year we were expecting demand growth to be 1.3 million barrels per day right now we are tracking 2 million barrels per day for the year that's how much it's surprised by and that is again it's in china us and europe the three places where the macro data is absolutely appalling i think you're at a point particularly in places like europe where it's base load demand right it's not that people are driving to pick up milk it is the bare minimum people need to go to work um, and industrial demand, which is already, by the way, uh, in the gutter and whatever little demand there is out of that. I think that's kind of been the main driver. In Europe, one thing I will say is that low prices has meant uh, people have restocked, like at the consumer level, people still tend to use heating oil. They've restocked a little bit over the summer, so that's probably boosted artificially demand somewhat, but that's still small at the margin, right? I think overall, um, what you are seeing is the consumer is still holding up very well, but industrial demand has been weak. Amrita, global oil inventories are at a six-year seasonal low. Um, where do we see oil prices headed from here? I think prices are going to head higher, up in probably towards $90 um, we do have refinery maintenance, which is seasonal, always happens. But the pace at which inventories are drawing, and my belief that OPEC Plus and particularly Saudi Arabia want to ensure that that continues and we don't get into oversupply, uh, does suggest that they're going to keep cuts going, at least partial cuts, if not the full cuts, going into year end. Um, that does tell me that inventory draws will continue counter seasonally, uh, which should put prices push prices higher. I am still more concerned about diesel and gasoline prices than crude because I think they are already trading at you know crazy levels, yeah. um, and that could go up even further. All right, Amrita, thanks so much for joining us. Amrita Sen there of Energy Aspects talking to us about um, the oil price. One of the things I thought was interesting that, that she mentioned um, to us before coming on the program was the flows. Yeah. We've seen so much money flow out of USO, which is, you know, the biggest oil ETF, 180 uh, um $180 million out of there in one day on Wednesday. Uh, and if the flows go like that, you know, you can expect to see the underlying uh, fall as well. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, just look, I'm just looking at the weather outside, Matt. I mean, record heat waves in Iowa, in Texas. My question, and I really wish I had a chance to ask Emery it, is can the grid handle it, right? I mean, this climate change is real, and we're feeling the brunt of it, and it's not reflected in energy prices right now. Yeah, for sure, uh, the grid cannot handle it. Um, and if we continue to get that kind of heat, and in the winter, everybody's starting to, you know, it gets cold in Texas now, which <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes, which hadn't happened so much before, um, and that is a problem for the grid. You know, if we all plug in our EVs, that also is going to just add to the issues. So we've got to, uh, we've got to really... Um, boost our capacity in terms of those grids. Later today, don't miss Tom Keene's interview with ECB President Christine Lagarde talking about what's going on in Europe. He is live from Jackson Hole, obviously, all morning. But then at 4 p.m. on Bloomberg Television and Radio, he will talk to the president of the European Central Bank. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Matt Miller alongside Damian Sassauer. Tom, John, and Lisa will be with you from 8 a.m. New York time. Special coverage live from Jackson Hole straight through noon, straight, straight through the Powell speech. So I'm really looking forward um, to that program. Right now, what we're looking at in terms of markets, um, you have S&P futures bouncing a little bit after the big drop yesterday. We were down more than 1% on the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ yesterday, almost 2%. 
percent drop in the Nasdaq. I think 1.87 percent was the loss. So now we're looking at what could be a little bit of a dead cat bounce. Traders, I'm sure, are going to be sitting on their hands until they've heard what Jay Powell has to say. Um, for the most part, maybe even turning off the computers um, this morning. So very interesting. Going to be very interesting to watch. Definitely the event uh, of the week, uh, overshadowing what we saw from Nvidia after that kind of fizzled out yesterday. Euro dollar at 107.97, so essentially 108. We heard uh, a little bit earlier that um, you know maybe the technicals support a higher euro, a, a lower euro dollar. I should say 105, 106 is what we've been hearing from people um, uh, throughout the past couple of days. Steve Sosnick from Interactive Brokers confirmed that. In terms of the yield, we've been all over the place this week. We were up to 434, the highest level since 2007 on. The 10 year, we've been down below 420. Right now, we're looking at four and a quarter. And there, for sure, uh, traders are waiting to hear what uh, J Palace has to say. And then, NYMEX crude, $80 a barrel, 80.09 right now, holding steady right around there. We just heard from Emrita Sen that demand has been, uh, I guess, demand has been consistent even with recession concerns in Europe. It's been stronger than the macro picture in China, but there's a lot more supply coming online. Under surveillance this morning, investors awaiting, obviously, Fed Chair Jay Powell's speech from Jackson Hole, looking for clues on the central bank's economic outlook. He's set to speak at 10.05 Eastern time. And then later on, uh, Tom Keenis got an exclusive interview with ECB President Christine Lagarde. She's also out there in Wyoming. That comes up at 4 p.m. Eastern. And clearly, Damian Sassauer uh, here with me. <laughs> Clearly, markets are waiting for this. You're not going to see much volume until the speech. I think the markets have it right. It's, it's going to be today, today's Powell comments. It's going to be about data dependency, obviously, and it's going to be about moving slowly. The real question is, can Powell communicate that without sounding dovish? So really, the ball is squarely in his court. I mean, think about where we were just last year at Jackson Hole last year. Recession indicators were calling 100 percent probability of a recession within the next 12 months. I think Bloomberg Economics was saying much the same thing now. I think the consensus now Bloomberg is that we're Economics, in for a soft landing. Uh, uh, Anna Wong's model was calling for a 100 percent chance of recession this year, which I thought was you know, pretty aggressive. Yeah, well, I mean, look, she wasn't alone, right? And so my point is, now, if you look at most recession indicators, they're calling for a soft landing, you know? So something's obviously changed. Let's see if Powell can deliver and not, uh, you know, yeah, mess I think, up the message. I mean, look, last time he said September's live, he said they won't cut rates for years. So he is certainly more hawkish than uh the dot plot, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, former President Donald Trump is back on Twitter. We're supposed to be calling it X now, but I don't think that's really going to stick. He posted his own mugshot <laughs> in his first tweet on the site since he was banned in 2021. The post came after he was booked in the Fulton County Jail in Georgia last night. If I read the story right, the former president spent 20 minutes in jail. I don't think that <laughs> means he was in a cage. The but, the uh, I think I got to say a little editorialization here on style. Great mugshot. Yeah, it's a great mugshot. I mean, look, Matt, I mean, the real question I have is, 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 is President Trump or former President Trump back on t Twitter X, whatever you want to call it now? He used to have 86 million followers. He only has 6.7 million on Truth Social after the Tucker Carlson interview this week on X. I mean, is the former president back on X? Uh, it looks like he's well, back. I'm back on X. And I know what I want to call it. <laughs> Not X. <laughs> China unveiling new mortgage policies aimed at halting a slump in its residential property market. The rules include more support for home buyers as they look to revive the world's second largest economy. And China has been, I think, slower than many market participants have expected in terms of the stimulus. Yeah. Um, they are asking uh, big banks to lend more, certainly in terms of mortgages. What's the story here? It's not just big banks. They're asking to lend more. They're asking foreign investors to invest more. They're, they've called a meeting. I think Goldman Sachs, Fidelity, some other big institutional investment managers are being invited to, the, to, to, to talk about why are they retreating from local equities in China. And so that's interesting. They've also offered, I think, to cut the stamp tax, uh, the duty tax on foreign investment in stocks. So by cheapening uh, the ability to 
invest in and own Chinese stocks. Clearly, there's some issues there. They want to bring foreigners back into the fold. Let's, you know, talk a little bit more about this. We've got Ian Shepherdson uh, with us now, chief economist over at Pantheon Macroeconomics. And of course, I want to get to the Fed and the important speech from uh, Jay Powell today with you, Ian. But first on China, you know, we expected them to do a lot more after the reopening seemed fairly lackluster. And Rita Sen said to us just uh, moments ago that at least gasoline demand is stronger than the other macros in, in the economy. What's going on over there and what do you expect from the authorities? Well, I think that the, the story of a, of a really disappointing post reopening rebound is real and will be sustained. I don't really see anything in the domestic economy to turn that around anytime soon. But the policy response, as you say, has been kind of piecemeal. Uh, it's been no sort of big bang events like we saw, you know, after the, the crash in 08 when China was extremely aggressive with huge stimulus. We haven't done that this time around. It's been much more gradual, much more let's try this and see if it works. Let's try that and see if it works and cross our fingers. Uh, and I think that probably continues for a while yet. Now, whether later down the road they are forced into do something much more aggressive is a kind of an open question. But the backdrop for all of this, I think, that you, everyone needs to appreciate is that China has some fundamentally really quite big problems which aren't going to go away anytime soon and aren't going to be fixed by small cuts in interest rates and shouting at banks to lend more to potential mortgage borrowers. You know, they have a massively overburdened, massively over, uh, over debt, over indebted private sector. Uh, the public sector isn't, so they can't afford to bail it out if they need to. But the private sector is carrying this enormous burden of debt. The consumer doesn't want to spend. The, uh, the, there's excess capacity in the manufacturing sector, so prices are falling, so that's hurting profits. It's a really big mess, plus, of course, the problems with the commercial developers that we all know about. So um, can this be fixed quickly? No. Uh, will it require more policy response? Yes. Uh, are we going to wake up one day and find they've done something massive? Well, no sign of that yet. You know, we have uh, there's a great piece on the Bloomberg today by Liz McCormick about the fact that our current president here in the United States and the previous president have opted to, um, you know, just pour fiscal <laughs> stimulus into this economy. Right now, even though we're not in a recession, we're going to run a one point six trillion dollar deficit. Is it possible that while Biden and Trump have op opted to run the economy hot, you know, spending trillions and trillions of dollars uh, and building up a ton of debt. The president, she is trying to break China's addiction to stimulus, trying to pull back on um, uh, the debt fueled growth model of his predecessors. Oh, I'm sure that if he could wave some sort of magic wand and get the economy to grow more quickly, more sustainably, without aggressive fiscal action, then he would do it. And the kind of answer, that's what they're doing right now by this sort of drip feeding the interest rate cuts and putting pressure on, on lenders and trying to attract foreign investors back into the stock market. These are all kind of uh, in place of doing something m more drastic. And, you know, they, they don't want to throw the consumer a huge pile of money. Uh, their, their view is that when European and, 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 the, U and the U.S. did that uh, during the, uh, the COVID pandemic, that was a mistake uh, with, with consequences. Uh, they don't want to get people addicted to fiscal stimulus. But on the other hand, they do have to keep the economy growing. You know, the last thing that the Chinese government wants to deal with, you know, is tens of millions more unemployed young people. I mean, they've stopped publishing their youth unemployment rate. That, that's not an accident. It's very high and it's likely to rise further. So there is a limit to how far they're willing to run this experiment of not doing more aggressive stimulus. Of course, what we don't know is where is that limit? When will the stimulus be ramped up and what form will it take? Clearly not yet. I mean, they're still in the let's try and do this in a piecemeal sort of mode. But, but there is a, a very clearly uh, the Chinese authorities uh, position depends on maintaining the, some degree of growth in the economy. Now that the about 5% target for this year is going to be very difficult. So they'll have to do more. Dr. Shepherdson, I wonder if you can square all that fiscal stimulus in the U.S. that Matt is referring to, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, with student loans here in the U.S. and what the more immediate impact will be on inflation and on productivity. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the impact of the CHIPS Act and the IRA has clearly boosted uh, commercial construction in the U.S., manufacturing constructions, boosted manufacturing jobs. It's been quite a big, uh, quite a big event. But at the margin, of course, that becomes less important going into next year. The big, the big bang for the buck comes in the first year. Uh, and from October, of course, the student loan repayments start again, which is about 1% of personal income if, it, if, if people choose to start paying it all off and, uh, at once. 
which is a big hit. You know, consumption is 70% of GDP, and taking out that amount of money from the economy overnight potentially is a threat. And this is why I'm very nervous about all these sort of blasé declarations that, well, the recession risk is over, it's definitely going to be a soft landing, we don't need to worry anymore. That makes me nervous. You know, we just don't know how people are going to behave when the loan repayments start. We do know that the excess savings of people built up during the pandemic, which was as a result of very generous fiscal policy, though three quarters of that money has now been spent. Plus, of course, what everyone doesn't want to talk about, the Fed's raised rates by 525 basis points and lags are a thing. It takes time uh, and longer than markets want it to take and longer than the media wants it to take for interest rates to work through. So I think the idea that we've now suffered all the pain we're going to feel from those rate hikes uh, is delusional. Whether the lagged effect is enough to trigger a recession, uh, it's a different question, but I think it's far too premature now to make the judgment that the risk is over, that's for sure. Dr. Shepardson, do you feel that markets currently underestimate the Fed's determination to normalize policy? And if so, what does that mean for 10-year yields? Oh, I think markets get it now. I mean, there was a period, you know, last year when markets uh, really didn't get it. And uh, I think Chair Powell, well, including the Jackson Hole speech last year, made it very clear the Fed would do whatever it, it takes. Uh, now that inflation is falling, and ambiguously the core rate's coming down very nicely, and even the, some of the sticky things in services are looking better now. Uh, so I, I, my guess is that this, this track will continue. I don't think it's just some sort of flash, flash in the pan. I think it's a sustained disinflation. But I don't expect Chair Powell today to declare any sort of victory. I think he will want to retain optionality, uh, just in case things go wrong again. I mean, you know, we've been disappointed over the last couple of years when we get good numbers followed by bad numbers. So we've all learned that lesson. He's not going to say we're done. He's not going to start promising rate cuts anytime soon. But I think ultimately there comes a point in every economic cycle where the market says, oh, OK, Fed, you know, you're talking tough, but actually we think that you've done what you need to do now. And at that point we see uh, yields rallying. So I, th I see a fair bit of scope now between now and the year end for the tenure to make a fair bit of progress. I'd be really disappointed if we didn't get you know, meaningfully below 3 percent uh, by the end of the year. And I would hope that by the time we get to the middle of next year, it'll be more like more like 350. So uh, definitely improving. But but again, we just need to be cautious. Chair Powell is not going to wave the victory flag today. I think we all agree he's not going to change uh, the inflation goal as well. 2% will keep it there. But why would they want to raise it anyway? I mean, it's a regressive tax on the poor. It's uh, as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber, as deadly as a hitman, <laughs> according to Ronald Reagan. Why would anyone think it's OK to run inflation at 3%? Well, I don't think it's okay to run it at three. I mean, I probably wouldn't object if they if they raised, raised the target to two and a half. Three makes me a little bit uh, nervous. I mean, remember when when the target was set to two percent back in 2012, we, inflation was persistently below that level. So it was an idea that it was a signal that we would get it up uh, rather than you know, run the risk of a Japanese-style deflation, which was you know a, a significant concern for a, for quite a while. So the, con the the context has changed during which the the inflation target was set. Lots of other countries have targets which you know, maybe are at a range, one to three, something like that. It seems to work perfectly well. But I, I completely agree with you. Sustained inflation is a really bad thing. Even Keynes, you know, the much maligned Keynes, uh, said that inflation <laughs> is the easiest way for governments to rob the people. Um, and that was right. Uh, sustained inflation that changes behavior uh, is a very bad thing. But it's not clear to me that two and a half would do that. Three, three and a half? Yeah, I'd be nervous about that. But the two yeah. target maybe is just asking a bit too much to maintain in the medium term. We're in a different world from, from when those targets were set. Yep. Well, that's the, the, what the symposium, I think, is all about structural shifts, right? Dr. Shepardson, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your commentary. Ian Shepardson there of Pantheon Macroeconomics. Now, Tom, John, and Lisa will be live from Jackson Hole with a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance starting at 8 a.m. Don't miss that show with Jay Powell's speech, plus the Peterson Institute's Adam Posen, Kristalina Georgieva from the IMF, Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker, and insight from Bloomberg opinion co columnist Mohammed El Arian. This is Bloomberg. If there was ever a soft landing, uh, taking six percentage points off the headline inflation rate without an increase in unemployment would sound like a soft landing to me. 
That was Jim Bullard, former St. Louis Fed president, speaking uh, with Bloomberg's Mike McKee yesterday. Mike was in Jackson Hole. Bullard was at Purdue, uh, where he is now the dean of the business school. Really interesting conversation, and he brought up maybe a new inflation uh, regime as well, which we're going to talk about in just a moment with Cameron Kreis. Right now, I want to take a look at the markets uh, and where we are. Um, just about three hours, a little less than, ahead of the market open. But you can bet there's going to be um, very low volume and traders kind of sitting on their hands until we get through that uh, Jerome Powell speech at Jackson Hole. Right now, S&P futures pointing up about three-tenths of 1%. You've got the euro a little weaker against the dollar, as is the pound, but um, not a big move right now. Still at 108 on the euro dollar. Ten-year yields uh, creeping very slowly higher, holding at about four and a quarter, where we finished the day uh, yesterday. And NYMEX crude also uh, kind of holding a level at $80 a barrel. We see Brent at just under 85. Um, so I think wait and see is what we're doing right now. Let me bring in Bloomberg's Cameron Cries to talk about um, what to expect from Jackson Hole. And Cameron, you know, uh, I was reading a lot of your work last night, fascinating stuff, and it reminded me of uh, an interview that Tom Keen had done with Claudia Sam a couple of days ago, where she said um, to her the most important or most interesting thing would be a discussion about uh, a change in our star, um, uh, which I thought was already like an ephemeral, abstract, you know, idea anyway. But um, is it the case that everyone kind of agrees? what it is now and that we're going to raise that forecast uh, today? Uh, uh, yes, it is uh, ephemeral. Uh, but when did that ever stop academic uh, or policy economists from talking about it? Uh, I would <laughs> say, no, it's not the case that everybody agrees uh, what it is. Um, certainly, uh, the FOMC seems to think that it's still 0.5%, given that uh, that's the dot plot median and has been for some time, although the distribution of those dots uh, have moved up somewhat. A couple of weeks ago, the New York Fed uh, staff released a paper suggesting that uh, looking at a couple of different uh, models, one of which had R star, I think, up to like 1.8 percent. And again, this is the neutral real after uh, inflation level the policy policy rate. Another of their models had it at 0.7%. So it's kind of like kind of like a, a carnival barker, you know, pick a card, any card, uh, you know, pick a pick an R star, any 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 R star. Uh, what I think it, it is fair to say though is that the 0.5% implicit in the Fed's dot plot looks awfully low uh, compared to uh, what those New York Fed models suggested, and also what we've seen empirically in the economy. If the neutral rate really were, neutral nominal rate really were two and a half percent, or the real, uh, we would have expected the economy to perform much, much worse than it has done um, over the last year and a half as the Fed has put rates up so aggressively. And the fact that it hasn't, I, I think, is a testament to the fact that something has changed. And, you know, to quote the the title of the symposium that, that maybe there has been a structural shift uh, away from the sort of post GFC regime of very low inflation, very low nominal growth and very low uh, neutral interest rates. Yeah. You know, I um, ever since I was a kid, I've been obsessed with this neutral real rate of inflation, mainly because on the Bloomberg terminal, Damien, if you type in T-A-Y-L go, you get the Taylor rule. So you can see where you know, John Taylor's rules estimate that the rate should be the Fed's benchmark rate. And you have to plug in your own variables, <laughs> right? So you can plug in what your own Nehru is, which I've always also found really interesting, and your own neutral real rate. I've always used 2%, but apparently now I think consensus is more like 25 And if that moves up, it's going to change everything. Right, my, right now, my Taylor rule estimate shows that we should be at 7.65%. Well, that's if you listen to Ian Shepperson, 2.5%. I think, look, you know, it only makes sense that we should, be, should, we should be talking about the Fed uh, ahead of Jackson Hole here. You know, for me, you know, there's a lot of other central banks that, you know, carry a lot of great meaning. And, you know, we have Powell at 10, but we also have Christine Lagarde at 3 p.m. You know, so for me, you know, Cameron, I wonder if you can tell us. 4 p.m. Is it 4 p.m.? There's 
Eastern time. Sorry, he's Eastern right. Time. That's my bad. But 4 p.m. Eastern time, and given you know the Euro PMI data that came out, Cameron, and all you know that's going on in the world, I wonder does that carry a little bit more weight for markets than Chair Powell at 10? I wonder what your opinion is on that. Well, no, uh, if not for the simple reason that uh, the U.S. is still the world's biggest economy, the Fed's still the world's most important financial institution, and very prosaically, markets are shut when Lagarde's speech will hit the tape, uh, and and obviously they're wide open when uh, Mr. Powell's does. Uh, clearly, Europe is at something of a uh, an inflection point insofar as they put rates up much, much more aggressively than anyone would have thought possible a year, year and a half ago. Uh, and unlike the U.S., uh, the impact seems to be feeding through uh, more vigorously. As you alluded to, the PMI data was pretty execrable uh, a couple of, of, of days ago. Uh, that being said, inflation remains more elevated than it does in the U.S. So that's kind of an unfriendly trade-off that the ECB is having to confront. Uh, they will need to sacrifice more growth uh, to get inflation back down to back down to target. Uh, we've had some uh, some of the usual e leaks uh, uh, <laughs> this morning from ECB sources suggesting that the arguments are building for a pause, uh, but that nothing is decided yet. Which you know that and five bucks, I guess, will get you a cup of coffee. Uh, these days, or, or four euros, or five euros, or however much it costs in Berlin or Frankfurt. So, Cam, you know, f for me, I, I guess the question is, in your opinion, what's the biggest pain trade for markets? You know, we saw when U.S. long yields, 10s and 30s, started to spike higher. We, we felt the pain there. Is it U.S. Treasuries? Is it the dollar? Is it the Japanese yen? I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Well, are, are we, I guess the, 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 the rejoinder question is, are we talking about uh, sort of short-term traders, or are we talking about investors? Yes. Right, because investors tend to have long only portfolios. So obviously, the biggest pain trade in that regard is asset prices continuing to fall. Uh, I mean, the the equity rally this year, I think, took a lot of people, including myself, uh, by surprise. Not only in terms of how it shot out out of the gate, but the magnitude that uh, of, of what we've seen. Uh, so I think at this point, given sort of tactical investor positioning, probably the biggest pain trade out there would be technology going back to where it was 12 months ago. Uh, and I think it, the reaction to yesterday's NVIDIA uh, earnings, which were uh, uh, you know, clearly very, very good, sure. and the guidance was clearly very, very good, and yet the stock opened up a lot uh, and closed more or less unchanged. Uh, I was just looking, I think the... The 500 calls uh, expiring today, you know, they they opened they opened at uh, 15 bucks or something, and they closed at 26 cents. Uh, that's pretty painful. Um, so I, I would suggest that the pain trade is that everyone who's been buying these short dated options to drive the market higher suddenly finds that money starts turning worthless, and uh, as if and as interest rates continue to adjust higher, then we find that this entire equity market rally this year turns out to be something of a head fake. Will that be the case? Mm. Quite possibly not, uh, but certainly that would hurt a lot of people, I think. Looking at the uh, at the Starbucks in Berlin, Cameron, right on the Brandenburg Gate, looks like a, a venti latte, which is my go-to, is five euros and thirty cents right now. But oh, I can't drink that stuff, man. Well, well, I mean, <laughs> if you're just looking for a filter coffee and you want to go uh, with a grande, then you can get it for three nineteen, which is pretty good. Okay, yeah, that, yeah, that's my that's my jam. Okay, three nineteen, that's not too bad. Cameron cries. Yeah. Great having you on the program. Thanks so much for My joining pleasure. us. You can read his macro man column on uh, the Bloomberg terminal or check it out if you uh, go to the website, Bloomberg.com. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Gets pretty wonky. Camera gets pretty wonky. Yeah, you yeah know? no, I mean, I, mean, I, I would have taken him as a strawberry acai refresher kind of guy, but, you know, that's, that's <laughs> or maybe a chai latte, iced something or other. Um, but, no, yeah, no, Cam's great. I mean, look, interesting that he says the pain trade, and he's right. I mean, the market value that's been made in U.S. equities – you know, that makes sense. You know, if that reverses in on itself, <laughs> I guess there's going to be a lot of money lost. All right. Coming up next, we're going to talk to Dana Dioria. She joins us from Investnet. Get her view on what to expect out of Jay Powell and Christine Lagarde at Jackson Hole. The main event with Tom, John and Lisa starts in one hour at 8 a.m. This is Bloomberg.
What's been supporting equities despite the higher rates that we're seeing is actually the earnings. A lot of people, a lot of companies are not feeling the pain of these higher interest rates. I still think the probability of a recession is quite high. I actually think we're on the cusp of a seminal change in Fed approach to targeting inflation. Jackson Hole, if you're a bond investor, is the kind of main event this week. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning from New York City. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Alongside Damian Sassauer, I'm Matt Miller. We're filling in because Tom, John, and Lisa are in Jackson Hole. But don't fret. They'll be along in just about 60 minutes' time. We've got special coverage with the OG surveillance team starting at 8 a.m., and that'll go through Jay Powell's speech uh, into the afternoon. In fact, Tom has an exclusive interview at 4 p.m. Uh, with Christine Lagarde of the ECB. So a lot to cover today uh, and a lot, um, I guess I was going to say a lot going on in markets, but actually that's not true. There's there's not much at all going on <laughs> in markets right now because I think people are waiting, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, look, if you just look at how great a quarter it's been economically speaking in the U.S., I mean, we're tracking at, I think, 4% growth here in the third quarter. I think the Atlanta Fed is at 5.8%. And 5 .8%, again, 5.8%, yeah. 5.8% and unemployment's at what? 3.5%. Go figure. Yeah, New York Fed at 3.8%. So there's a big delta there, but it's still better than a stick in the eye, no matter how you look at it. Dana Dioria joins us right now, uh, co-chief investment officer over at InvestNet to give us her take on, I guess, first of all, Dana, what's most important to hear from um, Jerome Powell at Jackson Hole? He seems to me already to have told us, like, September's a live meeting. Um, we still need to nip inflation in the bud. We're not done with that. And we're not going to cut rates for years. So what's, That's right. what's new? I, well, I think that may be why you're not seeing much movement in markets. I think pretty much what uh, Chair Powell is going to tell us has already been priced in. I, I don't expect any surprises from him today, right? I mean, he is completely empowered. If, if you look at the minutes, uh, uh, FOMC minutes um, from July, uh, you know, they, they were already striking kind of a hawkish tone. Um, inflation has come down uh, since then, but at the same time, most economic indicators have come in pretty good. Uh, GDP blowout basically compared with um, you know what was anticipated as you're as you're discussing um, you know growth looks fantastic right now so no recession yet I think Chair Powell is pretty empowered to just continue with the tone that he's had all along which is to say look I I'm going to look at the data I, I'm not going to tell you that we're done you know notwithstanding some of the other comments that we heard uh, yesterday is the growth that we're you know that we're looking at right now. Um, concerning because that means inflation could uh, be reinvigorated is is this boom going to be a problem leading to more rate hikes uh, leading to a bust yeah it could i mean you know you don't want to say growth is a bad thing right i mean it, it's fantastic that the economy has been so resilient who would have predicted if you look at it uh you know beginning of this year pretty much every pundit was saying you know uh, expect a recession in the second half um, and, and it's not that I, pr practically speaking, think that we're, we're past that necessarily, you know, to a certain extent, that could just be pushed out a bit. But the, the resilience of the economy has been fantastic. It does, of course, mean that, you know, the Fed, whose mandate is inflation and unemployment, uh, just just may want to hold on longer. Right. And, and what exactly what they've said, whether we get a rate increase in September or not. Um, expectations of a uh, you know rate decreases are are just probably too early. I mean, unemployment remains low. Uh, you know, the economy is doing well, and the Fed knows that inflation tends to come in waves, right? That it, you know, kind of looks looks good, but but you know, we know what's happening in wages. We know what's happening in energy. These are signs that inflation could come back, and there's no reason to think that the Fed is not going to want to have a firm hand on inflation. So I think it's entirely possible we get another hike. And I agree with you. I agree with everything you're saying. You know, the economy is healthy and, you know, the markets have really priced in, you know, much of the same, right, as it relates to Chair Powell and Jackson Hole. But to deliver that message, to deliver the message that we are going to pause in the face of economic growth, again, third quarter running at 4 percent with unemployment at three and a half percent, the messaging, you know, how are you going to thread that weave? You know, how does Powell thread that weave? And are the markets prepared if he messes up the end game. I, I think he's got the wind at his back. I, I hear you on this. And yes, the messaging, I actually think Christine Lacard has a more difficult, um, you know, 
uh, thread to or needle the threads, so to speak. But I think Chair Powell can stay pretty hawkish and the market is not going to get surprised by that. Well, I mean, he's been right. I, we saw the minutes and, and it's been clear sailing since the last, you know, the FOMC minutes. So I think the market fully expects a somewhat hawkish tone from him. I think he'd have to go pretty far to, you know, kind of up upset the market at this point. And he may well, given some of the comments that we've heard, he may well talk about, hey, look, we 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 could have a pause, right? I mean, even even a little bit of dovishness from him, I think, you know, the market might actually greet very well. I think the market expects him uh, to, to signal that he's going to retain a firm hand, that we're not going to blink in the face of, you know, in potential increases in inflation. I mean, the good news, of course, is that inflation really acted symmetrically, right? It, it went up very fast, but it came down very fast as well. So, you know, he, I, I think he's got tailwinds here for, for today. Dana, I love that you mentioned Christine Lagarde. You know, I wonder if you could just build on that for us. You know, what are the challenges that she faces in communicating her message? Yeah, I mean, she's got it. I think it's tougher for her because, of course, um, the economy there is, is not showing as much uh, resilience, looking like it's slowing down. Definitely, you know, I, I spoke about the fact that uh, economists sort of, some economists think the U.S. economy is soft landing. Some, I, you know, I, I get a lot of information from a lot of different sources. Some are definitely just pushing out the forecast and saying, no, we're, we're going to probably have a recession, but it's just going to come a little later. I think Eurozone, um, you know, just m more, more uh, of the statements are expect a recession. Obviously, growth is slowing there. Um, PMI data that has come out, business service, business survey data. So, um, but she still has an inflation problem to a certain extent, right? Or, or you know, um, it, it, at least to the extent we do. So, does she do another hike? before it becomes evident that it's really difficult for her to do another hike, right? Because before the before uh, economics, um, you know, kind of force her hand to, to stop on the hike. So I do think she has a tough uh, message. That narrative that you're talking about, I think is tougher on her than him. Uh, if we look at the markets, Dana, as you do, right, at InvestNet, um, what are you doing? We ran up to 4,500 on the S&P in an AI kind of frenzy. It seems <laughs> that, you know, the market feels like all of the good, uh, at least for NVIDIA and, and the rest is priced in, you know, the rest of the Magnificent, se magnificent Seven. So wh what do we do going forward if we are worried about the possibility of another hike and not optimistic about any cuts coming um, anytime soon down the line? Yeah, I think it calls for some caution, right? I mean, we uh, are we cater to advisors of retail investors, and I, I do a lot of um, talks, you know, along these lines, economic talks. And, you know, I, whether you want to predict that there's recession, in which case probably obviously market volatility is is still more to come. Or, you know, you think there's a soft landing, maybe slow growth, whatever that is. I think, you know, as investors, we're behooved to have some caution going forward. I, I think there's more risk to the downside in this market because, to your point, right, I mean, AI kind of comes in. But I think we all know AI may be, you know, a huge boon to the economy. It may increase productivity dramatically, but that's not going to happen overnight, right? We're, we're not there where we're going to see some great, AI-driven um, productivity gains in the next six months to a year. So, you know, the 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 AI that's been priced in, not, now it's kind of a waiting game on that, whether that's going to, you know, amount to anything that actually impacts cash flows, that impacts revenues. So, yeah, you, you've got this priced in great outcome. Multiples are higher. Really, the returns from this year are largely multiple driven, right? And then you have these downside risks to the economy still. I mean, we're we're not past, you know, we, we are seeing great uh, data come in on GDP, earnings, you know, obviously beat, but we're not kind of past, we all know just from history looking at it, monetary policy acts with a lag and, you know, it's not uncommon for unemployment to be pretty low before problems in the economy start to fester. So it, it's not a prediction, but it's more, you know, if you're an investor, um, you know, kind of battening down the hatches and, and you know, being ready for market turmoil is probably the smarter place to be. Long and variable lags. Dana, you know, you take what the market gives you. And one thing the market is giving <laughs> us today are positive real yields. I'm talking 10 year real yields here in the U.S. of yeah. about 200 basis points. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, usually that's a negative for risky assets. I'm curious to hear your yeah. thoughts this time around. 
Yeah, well, and also the dollar, right? Those are signs, too, that the markets are saying maybe there's um, trouble ahead. And and don't get me wrong, I, you know, it's not by any means my message that you should get out of equity markets. I, I'm actually, you know, again, I we, we work with advisors and advisor, the job of the advisor, one of the main jobs is to keep the client disciplined in the market. So they're not obviously selling out at the wrong time. I think it's a I think it's a question of your posture in the market. It's it's not a matter of get out of the market because you could well miss some great additional upside and you're not going to make that back. You're not going to time it right um, coming back in. But, you know, in the market, most retail investors, if they're not flat out, you know, market weighted, they're in some sort of a um, actively managed uh, portfolio that's probably low tracking error, right? We don't, you know, I won't say closet index, but but low tracking error to be expected. And if you're anywhere near market cap weight, you have a ton of these, you know, technology, growth, communication, right? The enormous eight, magnificent seven, as you said, uh, you automatically are going to have that just by being in market weight or close to market weight, which most of these investments are. So, you know, my what I would say to people is, um, you know, to posture a little bit more defensively. Rates are telling us that you know, uh, there's potential turmoil. And and the bond market is a, a pretty good as indicators go, right? It, it's it's a decent indicator. So, uh, you know, quality type companies, um, even low volatility, right? These types of style factors where you can tilt a little bit. Again, it, not that you're taking on massive tracking error, but to the extent that you're tilting away from market cap weight, that's the direction I would be going in. All right, Dana, thanks so much for joining us. Dana Dioria there of InvestNet talking about uh, what she would do in markets. You know, she points out that the bond market is a great indicator. And I go back to Cameron Kreis's macro, uh, macro man um, piece from, I think it was uh, – uh, like two days ago, he has a great chart of ten year the ten year annualized growth uh, uh, in nominal GDP and the ten year yields, and they track so yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, and now that we're starting to see yields tick up, um, you got to think nominal growth is going to to go with it. Well, I well. think it's that also that evisceration of the equity risk premium, right? I mean, the fact that look, your risk free rate now on a real basis, an inflation adjusted basis here in the U.S. is more than the dividend yield or the equity yield you're going to find on stocks. I mean, you don't see that very often. No. Uh, very interesting stuff. Let's take a look at what's going on in the markets uh, right now. We've just got about an hour, uh, sorry, two hours and 15 minutes until the market opens, um, but more like three hours until uh, Jay Powell starts to talk. So you do have S&P futures up after a big drop, more than 1% yesterday. Futures gaining about a quarter of 1%. Euro dollar unchanged there at 10808, um, which maybe that's good luck. Uh, the 10 the year yield also unchanged, hanging right around 425 after bouncing back a little bit yesterday from under 420. And Dimex crude just under $80 a barrel at 79.85. Brent crude, the global benchmark, is under $85 uh, a barrel. So as I said, Tom, John, and Lisa are going to be here live. Well, not here. They're going to be there live from Jackson Hole with a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance that starts at 8 a.m. And it's a show you don't want to miss because Jay Powell's speech uh, will happen, I believe, 10.05 a.m. Yep, We're yep. waiting for a 10.05 uh, a.m. start for uh, Jay Powell. Plus, on the program, we've got Adam Posen from the Peterson Institute, the IMFs. Kristalina Georgieva will join us. Uh, Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker is on the show. And a friend of the program, Bloomberg Opinion columnist and Queens College Cambridge President Mohammed El Arian will be on the program as well. Then later today, you don't want to miss Tom Keene's interview, exclusive interview with ECB President Christine Lagarde. That again, live from Jackson Hole on Bloomberg Television at 4 p.m. Eastern. This is Bloomberg. What has taken place here is a travesty of justice. We did nothing wrong. I did nothing wrong. And everybody knows that we did nothing wrong at all. And we have every right, every single right, to challenge an election that we think is dishonest. Former President Donald Trump there speaking after turning himself in at Fulton County Jail. He got a mugshot. Not sure if he got fingerprints. He must have. I think. 
Yeah, that was procedure. So uh, maybe he had to get printed. I mean, when I get arrested, I mean, they take my fingerprint. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, all the time. Same with me. <laughs> uh, Anne-Marie Hordern has never been arrested, I'm relatively sure. Uh, she is our Bloomberg Washington, Washington correspondent, she joins us now out of the nation's capital. And we joke around about this. Obviously, it's very serious. A president of the United States has been uh, arrested, essentially. He's been in jail, reportedly, for 20 minutes. He got his mugshot taken. I, we assume he got fingerprinted. Um, and I guess this just goes uh, and boosts his popularity with his base. Well, it absolutely does. So it is an unprecedented moment in American history that you have a former president not just arrested. This is the fourth time he's been indicted, showing up. He surrendered. As you say, Matt, a mugshot was taken. They recorded his weight and height, uh, 6'3", 215 pounds. I cannot independently 215 pounds? Um, I'm going to go ahead and call. That <laughs> no, that is not the case. I am 210. Is Donald okay. Trump only five well, pounds heavier I'm, than me? Uh, no well, this is something that obviously, but yeah, this is something that actually people are, are debating on Twitter. But, but in all seriousness, this is actually what happened in Fulton County, Georgia, yesterday for about 20 or 30 minutes when the president showed up to surrender. He then went to the airport. He talked about how this was all a sham. And then within really minutes, you had his super PAC campaign putting out fundraising alerts, and they're selling his mugshot on t-shirts for $34. So they are already monetizing this. And we do know that the Trump campaign does bring in a ton of money. And then he is using a lot of those funds from individuals that want to donate to his campaign to actually pay for these legal fees. Um, and these legal challenges are just continue to pile up and this being the latest. All right, so uh, this just, I think, supports uh, his base, but maybe not um, Republicans who are on— by the way, I think it's a great mugshot. Not that it matters, but it's like a cool look. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter uh, uh, to those who are looking for something else, right? And that's what the debate was all about. And I thought you had a fantastic interview yesterday with Nikki Haley. I thought a lot of her answers on issues were surprising, uh, surprisingly different from the answers you would have gotten from Trump in terms of the spending, uh, government spending. She criticized both sides of the aisle. In terms of abortion, she said, while she's pro-life, she believes it's a woman's right to choose what she wants to do uh, with her own body in terms of health care. So didn't you find that surprising as well? Well, a lot of things that Nikki Haley said on the debate stage and also in our interview is really tailored as well to how a candidate on the Republican side would need to pivot in terms of a general election to gain independent voters. When you look at some of the stats following the debate and who won, Washington Post, Ipsos, they did a 538, they did a poll, and what they found is that DeSantis actually topped the stage, then Vivak Ramaswamy, and then Nikki Haley. When it comes to independence, Nikki Haley, the former U.N. ambassador, the former South Carolina governor, did very well. And it's issues like this, like abortion, that we've seen really dominate dominate when it comes to moderates and independents and whether or not they want to go out and vote and who they're going to vote for. Well, you had on stage a lot of individuals that want to talk about a six-week ban, a 15-week ban. She said to the American people, we should be honest about the fact that there can never be a national ban because we just don't have the votes in the Senate. So she was trying to find some sort of consensus on an item like abortion. And then when it came to the economy, she didn't just throw the Biden administration um, out the window when it comes to spending. She also criticized the Trump administration, which, by the way, she worked for. She said $8 trillion was added to the federal um, debt under Trump. And she also talked about individuals on stage who voted in Congress to add to that debt. Ron DeSantis, Mike Pence. So she really took aim at everyone. And this would be how an, in, uh, an individual from the Republican Party would have to start to pivot in a general election to pick up those independent moderate votes. Anne-Marie, let's get serious for a second here. Interest payments on $1.6 trillion in student loans begins reaccruing on the 1st of September, right? Um, a group of 90 Democrats, including Schumer and Warren, and Warren are, are petitioning Biden to, to do something about it. Um, you know, I'm curious, at this stage, is there anything Biden can do to stop the September 1st deadline? And more importantly, what's the risk of doing nothing? Well, the summer first deadline is around the corner. I think what the Biden camp probably wants to do is say we give it our, we gave it our best shot. The Supreme Court, of course, recently struck down uh, what their plan was to help individuals with student loan debt about I believe it was up to 20k per person. 
um, and they can campaign on we will continue to try. It does seem like it is too last minute as these uh, repayments are going to be due. They have been frozen, remember, since the Trump administration. Trump, during the COVID um, economic hit, a lot of individuals were, were facing, froze the student loan payments. Um, but I should note, it's not just coming up here in Washington. On a lot of analyst calls for yeah. businesses, it is coming up. Levi's, Target, they're concerned that a lot of discretionary spending that individuals had because they haven't had to pay things like student loans, that's going to start to bite in the fall. You know, mortgage debt uh, is due as well. Yeah. I have interest payments on my mortgage. <laughs> Do you think they can cancel that? Um, Do we just cancel I'm, I'm, all debt? I'll, I'll have Tom make Don't you, calls. when you agree to a loan, don't you then have to pay it back? I don't understand why <laughs> we're trying to wiggle out of this. Well, I'll tell you this. You know, I mean, the reality is, and Anne-Marie, I wonder if you could just help me with this one last thing. I have to put my emerging markets hat on for this. You know, um, sanctions on Venezuela, right? Um, removing sanctions for free and fair elections in Venezuela, the Maduro. I mean, come on. Is that real or is that just trying to bring oil back online? Well, I think it's probably twofold, right? Uh, the sanctions in Venezuela has absolutely crippled um, their oil market. You have concerns about potentially the how, how gas prices may react um, going into an election year. But this is about if there was actual free and fair elections. We have seen Maduro in the past not allow free and fair elections. He's he's coerced individuals. Um, so this would he would have to make massive concessions in terms of an election in order for any sanction relief. We should just say Bloomberg is just reporting that there are talks about this. Um, we are not there yet. All right. Anne-Marie Horder, and thanks very much uh, talking to us from Washington, D.C., our chief Washington correspondent on uh, the Trump arrest and uh, what we can expect from the Biden administration. A total of $17.1 trillion in mortgage debt. Oh, wow. I mean, if you want to start just wiping away debt. Well, I mean, look, the 1.4 sounds like a much more manageable number, right? I mean, we just expand the Fed's balance sheet. We go right back at it. But I mean, look, you know, what's most interesting is how disinflationary the impact of those payments coming back online very well may be. So everyone's talking about upping the inflation target. I'm concerned inflation may come down even faster once these student loan payments start come back online, I don't know if the market's but we fully want prepared for that. Yeah, we're we, trying to get rid of inflation. Sure, right? we, sure, we want a hard landing, right? We want a recession. I don't know if we want that, hard but landing, that's kind but we, of. We, I, I think we want inflation to come back down to two percent, right? That's the generally accepted level, yeah. and we're pretty far away from that still. Uh, if you look at the uh, core PCE, it's more than double that. And that's what the Fed targets. That data comes out next week. We'll see what happens there. But let's see what happens once these student loan payments come back. I, I'm, 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 I'm skeptical. All right. Well, 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 we probably will see it because uh, the Supreme Court didn't let him cancel uh, those. Take a look at what's going on in the markets right now. Uh, we don't have much happening in futures right now, up a quarter of one percent. Um, you did have a drop yesterday of one and a half percent on the S&P, almost two percent on the Nasdaq. So gaining back a little bit of that, it looks like. But we're all waiting for uh, Jerome Powell at Jackson Hole. You can see the euro dollar at 108, the 10 year yield at 425 and crude trading at $80 a barrel. Don't miss later on today, Tom Keene's interview with ECB President Christine Lagarde, live from Jackson Hole. As Damien points out, she'll be giving a speech at 3 o'clock. We'll probably take that live as well. And then our exclusive interview with ECB President Christine Lagarde. That's at 4 p.m. on radio and television. Coming up, Tom Tesoris, head of fixed income at Strategus, a Baird company. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Matt Miller alongside Damian Sassauer. Tom, John, and Lisa will be along in just about 30 minutes time. They've got a live special from Jackson Hole. It's a show you don't want to miss, obviously. Uh, we're going to get the speech from Jay Powell. Uh, the markets may start actually moving at that point. And then later on, uh, Christine Lagarde will speak, and Tom Keene has an exclusive interview with the ECB president. So very much looking forward to all of that today. Let's take a look at what's going on in the markets right now. The relative relatively stayed after the big drops that we saw yesterday. Frankly, 
pretty amazing drops considering the fact that Nvidia had such a massive beat and we thought so much was riding on it. Uh, it finished the day unchanged. The S&P was down one and a half percent and the Nasdaq was down almost two. So a little bit of a bounce on S&P futures up about a quarter of a percent right now. No change in euro dollar, no change in 10 year yields and uh, NYMEX crude actually coming up a dollar six to eighty dollars and eleven cents under surveillance this morning. Investors awaiting Fed chair Jerome Powell's speech from Jackson Hole. We're going to be looking for clues on the central bank's outlook, uh, the economic outlook, obviously. That's at 10.05 Eastern, Jay Powell's speech at 10.05 Eastern in Wyoming. Later today, uh, as I said, Tom has an exclusive interview with Christine Lagarde. That is at 4 p.m. Eastern, which is an hour after her speech. So she'll give a speech at 3. But the cool thing will be her interview. Of course. Because not um, only is that exclusive... It's Tom Keen. It's Tom Keen, uh, also uh, must watch viewing. But you know he gets to actually ask questions, yeah. so it's not just the speech she delivers, but he'll get to dig into that. And I'm very much looking forward. Right, he's to very it. prepared in the line of questioning that he typically asks, which we all know. Yeah, well, it's definitely good television. <laughs> and uh, Damian Sassauer uh, here with me to fill in while Tom, John, and Lisa prep for the special. Let's talk about. Uh, something that Damien knows very much about China, unveiling new mortgage policies aimed at halting a slump in its residential property market. The rules include more support for home buyers as they look to revive the world's second largest economy. And I say you are well versed in this because emerging markets is your is your wheelhouse. It's your specialty for BI. What do you think about this? Matt, thanks for pointing that out. I am the chief emerging market fixed income strategist for BI in my day job. But, you know, for me, China is going to be all about growth. It's going to be all about the PMI data, which comes out next Thursday, which is <laughs> going to be weak. Um, and really the fact that they just can't get the consumer moving in the right direction domestically. I mean, households are in trouble. They're highly geared toward the property sector, which is in a funk. Just today, we're going to find out if Country Garden wants the nation's largest uh, property, private property developer, um, is able to come to terms with its creditors, right? And and I. The, the verdict is still out, but um, it doesn't look likely given Evergrande and some of those who have passed before it. Waiting to see that by the end of today. Well, something that key, is key to markets, and we're going to continue to read your excellent research, BI Go, uh, to find Bloomberg Intelligence. I want to talk about something. Uh, frankly, near and dear to my heart. Watches of Switzerland plunging after Rolex revealed that they've bought fine jewelry seller Bucherer. The relationship between watches of Switzerland and Rolex um, in, in a way is in question, given that the world's largest luxury watchmaker is now going to own its own stores. And this is key because Rolex has always said it'll be independent of uh, retailers. That's why it's had such a good relationship with it, with its author, authorized dealers. And um, this puts th that relationship in question. Will it favor its own stores? But hold on. Rolex does have one store, one store in its home city of Geneva. So, you know, it's not like the whole retail. No, I'm kidding. It's going to be all new to them. I mean, getting their Daytonas, their GMTs, their Submariners out through a, a chain of what I think it's 100 stores at, um, at yep, yep. yeah, at Watches of Switzerland. It's going to be interesting to see how things shake out. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be following this one very closely because we still have, you know, Rolex. Used Rolexes are still going for more than new Rolexes because if you want a new one, you have to get in line, you have to know an authorized dealer, and you have to wait for months um, to get it. Uh, Tom Tesoris, head of fixed income research at Strategus, joins us right now. Strategus is a Baird company, and we're happy to have him uh, here with us, especially uh, on such an important day for fixed income, Tom, what are you expecting? What are you watching for, listening for from Jay Powell? Well, I don't envy Jerome Powell today because no matter what he does, the market's going to move. If he comes out and suggests that there's more work to be done, which is what I think he's going to suggest, then you're going to see very likely the front end of the Treasury curve moves higher. The dollar rallies, risk assets wobble in particular, um, banks uh, in particular, um, discretionary spending sectors. If he comes out and somehow suggests that we're coming to an end of the tightening cycle and we see a light at the end of the tunnel, then pretty much everything except the U.S. dollar is probably going to rip higher. And that's a problem in and of itself because that means easing financial conditions when it's very clear to us that we're not 
getting close to the end of the tunnel. We're at a point where inflation is getting sticky and could very easily reaccelerate, especially when you see crude moving higher and you see wages continuing to remain four and a half to five percent. So no matter what he does, the market's going to move. But I, I, my hunch says he's going to side towards the, the hawkish side here and say that we have more work to be done, which we all know for the most part, but he's going to leave it open-ended what that means. And in particular, what that means is rate hikes could happen. They're probably done, but there could be more. But balance sheet reduction is going to continue indefinitely. Yeah, I'm watching the wages picture also very closely because, well, Damo's worried about student loans coming back, but <laughs> we've seen uh, unions get gain a lot of ground, starting with Deere, and we recently saw UPS, right? Those drivers are getting $170,000 a year if you include benefits. And now uh, the UAW is going to negotiate, uh, renegotiate contracts with GM, GM and, and others, and that's going to be absolutely fascinating. Um, where do you see the 10-year yield in, in this case? I mean, yeah. we, uh, we're up above 430 at the beginning of the week. The highest level since 2007, which I thought was absolutely fascinating, um, higher than the great financial crisis. Uh, and we heard actually Larry Summers told our David Weston a couple weeks ago that he thinks 475 is going to be the decade average that going forward. I mean, that's yeah. pretty high. Yeah. So uh, I'm not I'm let me put this put it this way. I am very surprised the 10 year hit a new high cycle high this year, not because I don't believe the fundamentals support it. But because I believed and I still believe that we're going to have a reversal lower, a, re a recession before we hit that next cycle high in the next cycle. But with that said, the second wave of inflation has already started. As you mentioned, we've got wages rising and we've got wage inertia in the pipeline for years to come. So that tells us that the second wave of inflation is just I don't know, six months to 24 months away at most. So eventually, tens should go up to those levels that Larry Summers is speaking about, a 475 to 5%. That would be consistent with nominal growth somewhere around 5%, tens around that level. But the question is, do we have a recession before we yeah. get there? That's the real question mark. And that's not an easy question to answer because that comes down to when does the consumer pull back? Does the consumer pull back and stop spending spontaneously? Or do we have to see credit cracks emerge to force the consumer to pull back? If you assume the consumer is not going to pull back, pull, pull back, then absolutely it's higher on the 10-year yield right. until we hit that recession. And somewhere around 475 to 5, very reasonable in my opinion. So sans a recession, 475 to 5% on 10 years, let's say by 2025, right? Yep. Is that going to be driven by break-evens or real yields? Both. So break-evens logically need to move higher. And let's just focus on 10-year break-evens. So somewhere around a 3% seems to be a logical level because, one, that's where inflation is getting sticky. Two, wages are getting sticky above 3%. And there's a very good chance that in the next two to three years, the Fed pivots towards a two to three percent inflation target. So we got break evens around 240 or so on 10. So a 50 basis point rise in break evens, very reasonable. It's not a huge move, but that gets you up to 475. But with the move in break evens, real yields need to probably rise a little bit. If not, then monetary policy is loose and you could have an even bigger move in inflation. So both. So in that environment, tell me which fixed in income asset classes are best positioned to be successful? You know, is it going to be MBS? Is it going to be munis? Talk to us about that. Well, very likely the front end of the curve, short duration investment grade corporates, and that's not a particularly exotic call. Yeah. That's a pretty much a safe haven for most investors, but that very likely outperforms in the short run, especially if the Fed only gets a few you know, rate cuts in along the way. So the Fed funds rate only comes down to, let's say, three and a half to four percent, because then it's not much of a move from four percent to, say, a six percent Fed funds rate. In contrast, let's say we have a recession, 10 year yields drop down to 350 and then we go back up to five percent. You're talking about a dozen yeah. percent to 15 percent <laughs> loss in tens. So at some point in time, we're going to have another round of bond pain. Dur duration losses. Yeah, exactly. A and probably spread widening off the back of that one would think. Very likely. So a steeper credit spread curve as yep. well. So the question again becomes, if you're long duration, you must be expecting a, a, a recession to come before we hit that second wave of inflation. And um, very likely, I do believe that second that recession is going to come, but that's really what you're you're expecting if you're long duration. You know what? That recession comes, and uh, you know, yesterday we were talking to Michael Darden from MKM. He said he thinks uh, junk is insanely expensive. <laughs> Those were his words: insanely expensive. Uh, if we start to see defaults, 
um, at, a, at a higher rate, isn't that likely, especially if the consumer is delinquent on loans and the student debt payments come back? I mean, isn't it likely that more companies are going to default, especially in the junk sector? Very likely. We have gone through the last two credit cycles where outside of the bank space, you really have not had a clearing of, of the rot in the junk space. And so you've seen uh, average defaults around you know 2 to 3%, when typically they're average 4%. So at some point in time, we're going to have a decade plus of four and a half to five percent on average default rates. Let's say you got a five percent default rate, then uh, high yield spreads at say three eighty or so are way too rich right now. If you have a three percent default rate, which is slightly higher than we've averaged over the last decade, then high yield's not too too rich. But I do think we're going to move move back to about a four to four and a half to five percent average default rate. High yield will prove to be too rich. But important thing about high yield and investment grade credit right now is that we are not seeing a need to refi any of those um, maturities because much of that maturity wall is 2025 for high yield, more like end of 2024 and into 2025. So we're still earliest six to nine months away from a big pickup and refinancings. When the new supply hits, that's when you see spreads widen, and that's when you start to see uh, public, uh, public uh, credit uh, begin to move into a space that's really not sustainable from a cash flow standpoint. We're not there yet, but we will be. I love that you're focusing on supply here. We had that 30-year auction last week. We saw the 30-year tips tail yesterday. We yeah. saw the two-year floating rate note. It wasn't so great. Talk to us about the plumbing of financial markets, specifically U.S. Treasuries. Talk to us about the TGA, the RRP. Does any of that give you cause for concern? Oh, right absolutely. And let's put the, let, this is a great backdrop. By the way, the TGA is the Treasury General Account. That's correct. Yeah. Sorry. The RRP is the reverse <laughs> reset repos. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Just, well, but my mom watches. You know, <laughs> people. Not everybody knows all this jargon. That's. So, so it's it seems insane to me that right now the Treasury is finding that it can't come to market without having to pay up, but we're expecting corporations to indefinitely not have to pay up. The Treasury is giving us a, a look at what's to come in the future. That is, the supply is no longer going to be very easily digested, whether you're a Treasury or a Triple C. So what's happening here is you're seeing Treasury supply now entering the coupon stack. It's no longer T-bills. And now go to your question about the TGA versus the reverse repo facility. When the Treasury was blasting T-bills into the market from June to August, much of that, not all of it, but much of it was coming out of the reverse repo facility. So it was essentially sterilized liquidity buying new sterilized issuance. That is changing because the Treasury cannot continue to finance itself at 5.5% when it's got a 4.25% on tens. That's not a logical strategy for the taxpayer. So they have to increase their coupon auctions. So we're starting to see that. And the market is saying once you open the floodgates on rising coupon auctions, there's more to come, and you're going to have to have a bigger and bigger concession. So again, the question is, do you have a recession before the supply jumps another leg? If not, then you're just going to continue to see the concession build in Treasury yields. Until something snaps. Until something breaks. And the crowding out effect. Yep. Tom, great having you in the studio today. Thank you so much for joining us. Tom Tesoris uh, there of Strategas. Say hi to Jason and Chris and Dan for us. Great group of uh, guys there at Strategas. Uh, we're looking at futures that are rising, but not substantially, just about a quarter percent and really little change in a number of other assets, except for oil, which is up uh, one and a third percent. Coming up at 8.30 a.m., Neela Richardson, chief economist at ADP, will join Tom, John, and Lisa in the Jackson Hole special. This is Bloomberg. This uh, reacceleration could put upward pressure on inflation, stem the disinflation that we're seeing, and uh, instead uh, delay plans for the Fed to uh, uh, change policy. Former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard speaking to Bloomberg's Mike McKee yesterday, kicking off our Jackson Hole coverage, of course, in just about 15 minutes. Tom, John, and Lisa will be along with special coverage throughout the morning. Take a quick look at what's going on in markets. Right now, nothing. Futures, after the big drops we had in the cash trade yesterday, up about a quarter of 1%. The euro stuck at 108. The 10-year yield unchanged at 424, 425. We do have a little bit of movement in crude 
And it's been interesting to watch oil move around. Uh, right now, it's back up over $80 a barrel. This is for NYMEX crude, and we do see the global benchmark, Brent, just under 85 um, So that's really one of the few assets that we see moving, because I think traders are waiting for Jay Powell's speech. That's at 10.05 a.m., so 35 minutes after the market opens, and maybe then you'll start to see some volume on this Friday. Joe Lavornia, chief U.S. economist at SMBC, Nico Securities America, joins us. He is, of course, a former chief economist for the White House National Economic Council under Donald Trump. Joe, great to have you on the program this morning. Thank you. Um, in terms of you know what the Fed is going to say today, you just heard Jim Bullard there talking about the reacceleration in the economy, and we've seen estimates from New York to Atlanta that are you know growth of 3.8 to 5.8 percent, and that could the the concern is uh, stoke inflation, uh, get those embers turning back into a fire. What are you looking at, and what are you thinking about um, the economy and the inflation right now? Two things. Thank you for having me, Matt. Uh, two things. Number one, if you look at past recessions, it's not unusual for there to be one last gasp in economic activity right before the economy rolls over. In fact, we've had it about two of the you know two thirds of the time where growth is over three percent, and the economy then goes into recession either that quarter or the quarter after. So GDP tells us nothing about where we're going. Those estimates right now are based on just a little bit of data we have for the third quarter, and it's going to change. That's number one. Where I push back against Jim comments, Jim's comments are, if you look at the good side of the economy, the New York Fed has a, uh, a supply chain pressure index. If you look at import prices from China, both of those series suggest continued and ongoing, ongoing deflation in goods. So the goods part of the economy is going to continue to soften, number one. And number two, if you look at the rents, the Cleveland Fed has a very nice rental, new rental turnover index it suggests rents are going to collapse. So this notion, Matt, that inflation is going to remain sticky, I don't understand where that's coming from. Uh, the inflation trends don't every month go lower per se, but the trends are definitely weaker. And if you look at the yield curve, the index leading indicators, where borrowing costs are for mortgages, autos, credit cards, personal loans, tightening and lending standards, all that suggests the consumer is going to be coming under significant duress. So, Joe, to be clear, you are a cynic of the soft landing scenario, and I am happy yes. to inform you, you are not alone. So talk to me about what a hard landing <laughs> really might look like. Is it going to be something shallow or perhaps more sinister? Recessions typically are nonlinear events, so if something has to happen while you're kind of sort of in what initially oftentimes is a very mild recession. For example, in 08, it was very mild. Uh, the services economy, looking at the ISM, was actually recovering through the spring. People were saying, many were saying that the economy had avoided a downturn. GDP grew almost 2.5% in the second quarter. Bear Stearns was saved by J.P. Morgan. Leading indicators were turning up. Then we had Lehman. So what would have been maybe the shallowest recession ever became a very deep recession. This time around, it will depend in part on what the Fed does if the economy starts to weaken further, as I suggest it will. What will the Fed do? What will happen on the fiscal side? The politics next year will not be good for growth, given the uncertainty in the election outcome. That could cause a freezing in, say, business investment outside of, say, a couple of hot areas like AI or, say, ESG. So it will really, to sound like an economist, unfortunately, it will really depend on what happens as we enter it. We can't say, I don't think anybody can say at this point whether it's going to be hard or whether it will be soft. It will depend what the policy response is, what the regulatory response is when it begins. So, Joe, I mean, you rightly point out that surge in real yields that markets witnessed back in 2001 and then again in 2008, right? So I guess, you know, when I think of those years, my question for you is, do we think a major correction is nearly upon us here? I mean, and what might that look like? The, the equity risk premium, if you take three-month bills at yielding, you know, 5.5 percent, suggests the equity premium is significantly negative. Yeah. And a correction could look something similar like what we saw back in 01, where valuations are totally askew. From, from from what you could earn risk-free in the bond market. And if you look at the narrowness of the uh, equity performance, it does suggest stocks are extremely overvalued. However, if the Fed becomes less hawkish, they start to lower interest rates, most of the rise in real rates has been due to expectations the Fed won't be as aggressive in cutting. It's not been a break-even story. Break-even inflation generally has been very contained. 
Uh, so if the Fed does cut rates and equities can grow into their valuations, I worry the Fed is going to keep rates too high for too long. There'll be some break in the system. It will become self-feeding um, and self-sustaining. The Fed won't move as quickly as it may be supposed to. That causes a deeper recession. And then you're looking at stocks, say, somewhere S&P around 3,100. I want to ask about, uh, Joe, your former boss and, and President Biden, both of them spending money like it grows on trees. Uh, I think President Biden put an extra, uh, 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 well, a $1.6 trillion deficit is what we're looking at this year. And President Trump spent, you know, $8 trillion. Is there is there anyone who's going to call for some kind of fiscal responsibility or are we all, um, no. you know, modern monetary theorists now? Yeah, I, I don't like the modern monetary theory at all. I don't think I think it's sort of they, there might be a valid point somewhere there. But uh, but and we saw what the, when you spend a uh, committee for a responsible budget. We said we had seven, six trillion in, in, in COVID spending um, and we spent almost all of it. And then the Fed did about another seven trillion when they weighed it up. So when you have all that spending, you're going to get inflation, which is what's happened. Uh, there does not seem to be any desire in Washington right now to. Uh, be more fiscally responsive. And unfortunately, I would argue the fact that the Fed's got this playbook of QA uh, has given Washington on both sides uh, the ability to spend, perhaps in the old days where that wasn't the case. Remember when uh, Alan Greenspan said if Bush 41 raised taxes, we'd cut interest rates a little bit. And that's what happened. That That is a relic of the past. So I think right now, uh, while I clearly would argue that Mr. Trump's policies and Mr. Biden's policies are totally different, uh, in aggregate, there doesn't seem to be any desire to uh, to have a good fiscal house. So what does this mean for, I mean, Liz McCormick has a story out saying that just the uh, interest cost servicing the debt that we have is going to eventually eat up 20 percent of our tax revenues. Um, you know, when does this become a real problem? When do we see a debt bomb? I don't think we see a debt bomb because the dollar is still the world's reserve currency. Uh, there really isn't anything at this point to replace it. That might change over the next few decades. We could finance ourselves. It'll depend on what the cost is. But Matt, one of those reasons those interest costs have risen so much is that we've had a record rise in, in interest rates. Uh, the Fed funds rates up about 500 and basis points, 525 basis points in the past 15 months. And that is what's driving interest costs. And the fact the yield curve is so massively inverted tells us that monetary policy is too tight. When the economy goes into recession, the Fed eases. Uh, that will help lower those interest costs. And then we see what happens thereafter. Joe, great talking to you. It's been a long time. Hope we speak to you again soon. Joe Lavornia Hope there, so. Thank you. SMBC, Nico Securities America, talking to us about what to expect from Jackson Hole and uh, this U.S. economy. Um, Taking a look at markets, we're not seeing a lot, and I think you're going to see very light volume at the open as well. Futures now up about two-tenths of 1%, no change on the euro or the 10-year, uh, and crude bouncing up just a little bit. But, of course, you're going, to expect, you're going to expect, Damian, traders not to do anything serious until they hear what Powell says. I'm thinking bacon, egg, and cheese. Well, I like egg whites personally. You know, maybe like a, an early lunch, right? You know, something I light. I whole egg, salad. which is why I'm 210 pounds. But do <laughs> I look as look big at, as no, President Trump? No, no, no. Is you he look really 215? I think they meant 250. <laughs> Did they actually weigh him on a real scale? Um, probably. I do not believe that the former president is only 215 pounds. Uh, that's just, that just seems like made up. And I can't believe that they would do that at the Fulton County Jail in Georgia. Coming up next, a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance begins. Adam Posen is going to join us from the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Tom, John, and Lisa are going to take you through the Powell speech to Christine Lagarde. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.